So I'm a little nervous. I'm going to try not to read. And I just want to thank everyone for being here today and thank the Northwest Eco Building Guild for having me speak tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about land use code and some building code uh, regarding uh, data use or detached accessory dwelling units. I'm a registered architect in uh, Washington State, and I've designed over 10 dadus, uh, including one at my own home. And so some of you may, might live in Seattle, and some people might live in another jurisdiction, and a lot of things that I'll talk about tonight overlap between jurisdictions, even though there might be subtle differences. <clears throat> So, I'm going to talk about code, and doesn't that just sound like a snooze fest? <laughs> <laughs> like a total snooze fest. And I would say that code is actually one of the most important things, because it's regulating what we can do and what we can't do. And by regulating what we can do and can't do, it's reflecting our values as a society. And so I just want to repeat that, because I think it bears repeating the code, both the land use code and the building code, reflect our values as a society. It impacts cost, and it impacts affordability and it impacts form and site design and how we live. <clears throat> also, I just also, I want to mention that one of the things that's really important, even though it's not about code, is thinking about why you might want to build a tiny house or a detached or attached accessory dwelling unit or micro house. Um, that's also comes into play and then in turn turns into our, our code. <clears throat> so I'm going to just jump in and talk about converting structures. And one way to, for a dadu, and so one way to convert a structure is to take a garage and build it out, maybe add on to it a little bit, either out or up. And in this particular example, uh, we just renovated the structure and added on a little bit. And you can see the foundation started here, which is here, which was held back from the existing tree to try to not affect the roots. And then the little addition right here is not coming out so far so that it both can uh, respect the tree and it also has to do with the land use code and the setback. So this garage had a non-conforming setback, which we reused. Um, and there's a couple of interior photos and a plan diagram. And you can see here where we added on the wet areas so that we could extend our utilities across to it, which also are regulated by code. <coughs> And then another way to convert a structure is to add on top of it. So this was added on top of a uh, workshop or garage, uh, which also had a non-conforming setback. And when we added on top, we actually had to make the structure smaller. And then we also had to meet all of the height requirements, which meant that we had to shave off the top of the existing wall so that we could fit both levels underneath the height limit. And you can see this door here and this door here are the same door. And the eave and the eave are the same and we're pretty, pretty tight up to the house there. And just a couple of more uh, images from construction of the interior where we vaulted the inside so we could get some height into the living space above. And then a plan diagram where you see the existing green part on the left, and then how we had to uh, meet the five foot setback requirement from the property line, which is here, uh, on the uh, addition, which added structural and construction complexity to the process, which means it added cost. 
Um, and then yet another way to do a dado is to just build a new one in your backyard. And that's what this is an example of. And by the way, this one will actually be on the Green Home Tour in the spring. So you can see the backyard and then the new two-level dadu, which is being is going to eventually be used as a for a home-based business. And it has storage down below and then a living studio space above. And the living studio space is larger than the parking space, so it's cantilevered. So you can see that outline there. <coughs> All having to do with the land use code and meeting the gross floor area requirements. And a couple of images from the interior of the studio space. So I'm going to jump into setbacks and some other initial requirements. In Seattle, the um, uh, property has to be at least 4,000 square feet to add a detached accessory dwelling unit. And then there's some other um, requirements besides that, um, one of them being that um, you have five-foot setbacks Oops. along here. And then you have a rear yard setback for the entire property, a front setback, and five foot side setbacks. So you can see in this, <coughs> I'm going to move this. So you can see in this, the light green is showing the rear yard setback for the property. And then the um, dark green is showing the actual buildable area in the rear yard for the dadu. So it has this five yard set, five foot setback. <coughs> and then if you have an alley, you get to have a little more space because your setback is set from the center line of the alley. <coughs> and then a couple of other um, uh, setback requirements are that the eaves have to be five feet from the dadu eave to the house eave. And so then talking about lot coverage, all the structures on the property whether it's your house, the new dadu, a garage, a shed, a deck that's 36 inches or more above grade, a covered front porch, all have to fit within a 35% lot coverage. So if your property is, if it was 1,000 square feet, it would be 350, and then 5,000 square feet would be you know, five times that, so what, 1,750 <coughs> square feet. Um, and so sometimes it, an, another aspect of it is that you can only cover 40% of the rear yard. So this light green part that I referred to earlier, only 40% of it can be covered with the dadu. And so you may want to have the dadu be partially in the rear yard and partially not in the rear yard. But how, do, how does this reflect our values as a society? And um, what I would say is it means that we're only going to cover a certain amount of land with structures in single family zones. And so we've said as a society that's what we're, what we're choosing to do. So I just want to make it really clear that we're choosing to do that instead of it absolutely having to be that way. And it also means that we're separating structures from each other on different properties and within the same property. And that has positive and negative benefits. One of the positives being that we get to have light and air coming into our structures and spaces for trees and gardens and decks. I'm going to take a side trip into utilities. Yet another interesting topic. But it has an effect on site design because we don't do a new connection to the street with the sewer. We, do a, we typically do a connection to the side sewer that's coming out of your home. And so if, say, your side sewer coming out of your home is pretty shallow under the grade, 
then that means that it's less distance that you can have the dadu be away from your house because the sewer line has to have a certain amount of slope or fall in order to actually drain properly. You don't want to drain the sewage uphill. <coughs> you can pump. I never recommend pumps. <laughs> I'm a fan of gravity when it comes to sewage. Um, and uh, then, of course, there's the sewer line has to be in a separate trench. And you can see it right here. It's been covered up. And then there's another trench that has water and electric in it. And those can be diagonally separated, but in the same trench. So you can see this shelf where the electrical is going to go. And so then, other things about utilities. What about power? Are you going to have two meters, one meter? If you have one meter, is your um, panel upgraded? And does it have enough power to be able to come out of it to feed that new daddy? Or if you're going to have two meters, is it going to be separately built? Um, and what about your water line? Has your water line been replaced from the street? Or is it one of those little teeny tiny galvanized lines that's filled with gunk and you don't have any uh, water pressure in your house? So it ultimately it makes sense to replace the water line from the street so you can then extend it through your house to the dadu. And then of course there's gas, if you want to have gas on the property. And I'm going to get back into the land use code and into height requirements. What ends up happening in Seattle is that we have a base height and then a sloped um, uh, roof height um, bonus for dadus, and it's dependent on the width of the lot. So the wider your lot is, the taller the dadu can be. So on level, some level that makes sense because it just fits within the proportion of the property better. But on some level, it also doesn't make sense because you still need to be able to live in the structure. Um, but the base heights tend to be about 16 feet, sometimes a little lower if your property is more like 30, 35, or under 40 feet wide. With the roof height bonus, for a gable or a hip roof, it can go up to 7 feet. Uh, above the base height, so up to 23 feet high to the peak, um, depending on the width of your lot. And for uh, shed or curved or butterfly roofs, it's up to four feet, also depending on the width of your lot. Now I'll just talk about a few more requirements. Oh, actually, I want to make one more point, which is about the um, height limits. How, what do they reflect in our society, and does it do these rules reflect a preference for traditional roof shapes? Is that what we want or don't want? Um, and are we preferring to have the structures sit lower to the ground, even though the land use code might sometimes be in conflict with the building code and how people live in spaces? And then the building code is regulating you know, height in a different way, like our comfort, our light, our air. Continuing on with some other land use code things, uh, parking. Um, basically, one additional space is required when you get a permit for a dadu, um, unless you already have two parking spaces on your property or you are in one of the urban villages, or you meet some other exception. And the parking doesn't have to be inside a structure, it can be outside, and it can be tandem, meaning it's you know, uh, front, front to end of cars. They don't have to be side to side. But what does this reflect? By requiring the parking space for nearly all dadus, aren't we saying that cars and the storage of them equals housing for people. And so I just want to say that again, we're requiring this parking and we're equating that with dwellings for people instead of making dwellings for people what's primary. <coughs> There's also an owner occupancy requirement 
And that means that you have to sign the covenant with King County and file it before you get your permit and you're required to live on the property for six months out of the year, either in the Dadu or in the house. And so when I think about the fact that an investor um, such as ourselves or a consortium of investors can go buy a single family property and rent it out and nobody's telling them that they have to live there or who should live there, I don't see why we need to um, also regulate um, if we want to add a second unit to our property and increase density, having the owner live on the property for six months out of the year. And then the last land use code item I'll talk about is gross floor area, which is 800 square feet is the limit, and that's measured to the interior wall of the space, such as the drywall. And if you add on top of a garage, and keep that garage for a workshop or storage or parking, then that still counts as part of your gross floor area. So if that garage is 500 square feet, then your daddy living space can be 300 square feet. And this is another example of how as a society, through the land use code, we're equating cars with people. And a couple of building code requirements, um, the living spaces need to be seven feet tall, and if it's a sloped space, then it needs to be, um, if it are a vaulted space, then the short wall needs to be at least five feet high, and then 50% of the space needs to be seven feet high or less. And then there needs to be six foot eight in front of things like toilets and shower heads and sinks, I think for obvious reasons. And there needs to be egress windows in the sleeping area and a three foot wide door into the unit for both egress and to move things in and out, which reflect our value as a society for safety and comfort. <laughs> Last May, there were some land use code changes that were proposed, and it went through an, uh, an appeal process for the SEPA DNS, a bunch of jargon. Um, but what ended up happening was that the city lost that appeal and now uh, there's going to have to be an environmental review and a certain amount of process that's undetermined at this point in time. Uh, to, in order to make changes like not requiring parking, not requiring an owner occupancy, allowing an EDU and a DADU on one property along with a home and increasing units, et cetera, there's a whole list of changes. And since this is kind of in a never-never land right now, I would say if you're a proponent of it, or not a proponent of it, contact your council member, contact the mayor, ask them to push this legislation forward and do what it takes to pass up. And just in wrapping up, all of these code requirements affect site design, lot coverage, setbacks, height limits, utilities. They indicate the values of our, of our culture, but they're also a framework for creativity. And they create other considerations such as shared outdoor spaces between the dadu and the house, privacy between the dadu and the house, privacy between the neighbors and the dadu, adding lots of daylight, or just making sure there's enough storage. And I would say, What's most important is why you're doing this and what's most important to you and how it can affect our societal values and create change in the code. So the first thing I want to acknowledge is thank you for having me here. It's like you are my family, the eco people of the world. So. Um, it's so much more fun to be with you than a lot of the other other uh, groups that um, I have to be around every day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, first of all, it's like talking, you know, we all know this stuff. So I'm going to do a little bit of review. The very first thing that I was planning on doing was having, um, um, one of the things that my mission is, is to educate. That's, the, that's been my goal for about 40 years. Um, the way we're doing it right now, I was going to show you a new a film and I was I was just going, you're next. Um, because these are short little videos, YouTube, which everybody watches. You watch and put it on, and every all of a sudden, you, 
it's viral. So it's really important now to use some of the new ways that we're, you know, we can um, educate people and that they like to see, you know, visually what we're doing. So I was going to show you one, but you can go to our website and you're going to be the next one because this, these are frequently asked questions and we just need to solve it really quick. So and that's really what we're trying to do is just solve the problems. So I'm sorry, I'm with Green Pot and I am Ann Roth. And uh, we've been, I've been designing for about uh, 40 years, and this is sort of like the, you know, I'm trying to get more and more involved in how to uh, solve a lot of these problems. So, one of the things that people want to know about, first of all, is like, where should I go? What, you know, how do I even start? So I just go, you know, green, think about the building guidelines. So you want to do walkable, bikeable, someplace that you're close to your community. Think community. Think about a site that you have. Your house orientation, you want passive solar. Um, this, I think one of the biggest things that we're missing right now is you don't want just to build a house. You want to showcase how you can live sustainably. And that's the, there's a whole paradigm of that and permaculture of building into this. So. House orientation, natural light, you're going to get a lot of heat from the, from the sun. Of course, you're going to think about privacy when you want to start compacting these, these buildings together. Um, access, where the wind's coming from. Um, you want landscaping for shading. Let's just do this naturally. Then, most important, people want to know about site costs and feasibility. Can I do this? Well, big example today, a building department, a big expensive house I get to design was $10,000 to hook up. And then I get to do this small house over here, $10,000 to hook up. I mean, and then the same thing with a building department. So with a permitting, with the, you know, it's like I can't stop that. So the only way that we're going to get by this is to do ADUs or boarding houses, sharing kitchens, sharing things together, you know, and start thinking about different solutions that honor the code but, you know, we can be creative with it. So, um, also about protecting the site. So, when we finally get the site, and I don't usually like to even talk about a plan until we're on the site, because the site is really 90% of your design. You want to know, first of all, minimal disturbance. You don't want it, you know, cut and fill and all of that stuff. You want to honor what's on the site. You want to talk about, as they say, how to create a sustainable li um, lifestyle just right on site. So, you know, you're using a lot more uh, edible landscaping and things like that. Big thing is storage. People don't like to give up their stuff. So, um, then the flexibility. This is huge. So, the pods or these smaller um, buildings. I'm really trying to educate people about it. it. Really makes sense not to have one big stupid house like I have. Um, and I've been creating pods for the rest of my life because it's not working. Um, then also, in um, one of the things that I, I talk about most is about that really in the longevity of your house, um, there is a very small amount that you're paying your initial building cost. The rest you're really just pissing away in utilities and maintenance because it's not necessary. I mean, this is like, this is what's wrong with building. So we've just, I, we're just stopping that. This is like taking control, yay, we talked about that, yay. Um, and figuring out, let's just do our shell first, energy efficient, low maintenance, non-toxic. I don't really care about the insides, you know, have, have fun with that. So um, the, you know, this is what I just was saying, that we're talking about saving energy, Thinking about saving material and design, water. This is our next most valuable thing. Um, and um, we're going to make these tighter, more durable, stronger. We're going to use things that are being recycled or renewable. And um, this is a really fun project. So you saw the last thing. It was uh, actually actually on our um, <coughs> it's our model home in Port Townsend, which is where I'm, we're uh, based out of. And this is the first time I was going to showcase it tonight because we just got it. This is the future. This is a virtual tour that we can actually showcase people. You put your cell phone in here and you can walk through these models now and you can 
you can see, I can demonstrate what it is to be low end, what it is to be high end, what you know, where the price points are, and it's a it's a it's a tool to um, do a, several things. One is you know again to possibly do communities where we can just quickly um, render these up. You know, we can get some uh, prices on them, and we can invite people to see what they might be experiences, and we get their money up front. You know, they can buy into it. We're not getting investors, in. <clears throat> and so we invite people to participate in a project on a, on, a, on a certain piece of property. So I'm really kind of excited about it. So this is about went backwards. Um, this is about preserving vegetation, about plants that are appropriate to the climate. Um, we're going to group plants according to their watering needs. We're going to use impervious areas, less grass, edible landscaping. So, and this one is so much fun in the future. You will see the fire flickering in the in the fireplace. You'll see the waterfall, and you really almost have to not want to hold your hand on a on a table. So, this is the future. It's kind of fun. Um, so, in this model home right here, we put it up um, strictly to um, demonstrate a number of different things. Local funding, um, energy um, savings, or a bunch of energy tips, uh, how we do it. But most important in Port Townsend, we had 40 different local artisans that we designed around for this particular pod. So we call it the art we live in, and you'll see that these are opportunities like for doors that a lot of artists can be, our, our people can make doors, or a lot of different things that can be showcased. Uh, so it's made in, um, made in the area. So phantom loads are another thing that we talk about for energy. Um, phantom loads are all those things like charging, um, charging things um, that that are trickling power all the time. So we just have things like turning off switches to just to kill all the the, the plugs and things. Um, we talk about uh, fans that are on timers, and of course LED lights. Um, we are all renewable energy because these are 300% tighter when we start up. Oh, and unfortunately, the um, film was talking that we build with structurally insulated panels. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, we are tighter, 300% tighter in the home. So it becomes paramount what we talk about on the inside as far as indoor air quality. So a lot of our uh, designs have high windows, so we're lighting light in, and you saw the interior door, which also lets light through. So the, um, on water conservation, I'm sure you know a lot of these things. Um, shower heads, dishwashers, programmable uh, irrigation systems. We're finding uh, solutions for rainwater collection, not just the rainwater co collection, but let's just see how that can also sell water plants. You know, like think about different ways that you can do the whole system at once. Um, hot water recycling, water uh, recycling water. Oh, right here, for instance, that little machine right there um, is a water filtration system, and it also does a pH uh, balancing so that we can use the 2.0. It's so acidic that it can kill um, uh, things like viruses and mold and mildew with just water. So it's a 2.0, like a, uh, as acidic as a vinegar, so that now we're not putting it in our houses, we're not putting it in an environment, we're not, um, uh, we're not breathing it. So the excess water then goes to the, the, uh, the drawing on the right is actually a vertical garden. So the excess water goes to that. So that's a solution for um, you, you know, not having any of the water there. Okay, so this is where we really need to focus. This is one of the biggest things now that in our houses, it's sometimes 300%, um, I mean, three, three times worse inside than outside. And it comes because we're not paying attention um, to the things that we're bringing in, pesticides, um, flame retardants. Everything in our, in our house is just filled with uh, toxins if we're not careful. So we took on, as designers, really focusing on the inside of these houses. So, First of all, it needs to be properly ventilated, um, no VOCs, um, no cleaning, as I was saying, chemical storage, no carpets. Um, and then also, we have all of our organic uh, textiles and things like clay walls. But most important that we also focus on a lot about cleanability, 
<clears throat> so, and of course storage. And so a lot of these things are just that we can go over with, but it's just like, just think about fewer uh, wall cabinets and more drawers, because it's like three things that you're doing. Um, and the finishes and all the being antimicrobial is easy to, to clean down and clean up. Okay, <clears throat> then we took this on. So one of the problems with small homes is that you need to have uh, more innovative uh, storage. So we are building, um, building, modulating the furniture and, and coming up with a lot of different ideas along that way. So imagine that, you know, most of the problem is everybody is, they need more flexible spaces. So we can design things that are Murphy beds or beds in the ceilings or, you know, a lot of the innovations that you can do about just having your room divided by two or more instead of a, a wall then it's still gonna be a lot more functional. And that's where we need to push every single house. Okay. As I say, one of the big things is, uh, is this whole toxicity. And so by not even having it available, we're, you know, this is what we're trying to push towards. This is, chair right here is all organic, made with our textiles and um, our new tobacco dyes, which is one of the things that is, this, I think, the second most polluting thing in the environment right now are the dyes. The, 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 all the dyes in your fabrics, all the nanofabrics. There's going to be some great classes that the, that the field is, is all about, healthy homes. So this is what we're really trying to hit hard is, is an acknowledgement of you know, how the vinyls in your house are off-gassing, you, <coughs> the combustibles. So we actually are all electric because we don't even want any combustibles in the house. So this was the first thing that I started thinking, okay, well, I'm just gonna make a bunch of, showcase a bunch of little homes because they've gotta be, you know, um, I'm gonna have a, a, a factory. And here's the possibilities that you can create going down the road. These are all uh, a modular home, which means that they were 16 feet wide and 13 feet tall and they're built in a factory. Well, the banks actually don't want you to build modular homes, so they they want you to site build the homes, and they were having a hard time getting them into on Bainbridge and a few other places. So we went back to um, stick building, uh, which gives you the option again to design for your site using the same sort of a recipe that we came up with. We were also asked to do a project over in Colorado with these tiny homes on wheels, which were really fun. You know, you can really get excited about this. Um, so, um, we Casa actually rents these out as vacation rentals, but we had an opportunity to do a lot of small homes, which <coughs> you, I'm showcasing here on the website. I'm inviting you to just be inspired and get some ideas about these. Um, these were, I'm gonna whip through these a little bit, but you can check on them later just to know that they're available. Go ahead. Um, one of the other things that I realized that these are all eight feet wide and it got really old, hard to um, you know, come up with, that's, that's tight. You know? And you can go nine feet if you have somebody that's driving, your car, like a commercial, um, driver. So a lot of times people don't want to move it a hundred times. They want to sit with their pot. So you can make them nine feet and a little bit longer. Okay, so here's some of those ideas. Again, on site, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to have to flip through these. So this is probably the most important thing I wanted to talk about tonight was that um, we all are getting older and it's going to pretty much double the next three years. I mean, three, three decades. So we need to prepare ourselves for these places, um, for, for supporting our, like I've just got my father with me. I know I don't want to go into a nursing home. So what are the solutions? So um, this, the strategies are obviously to have our, get support for our seniors and make these communities available for them. I'm just gonna whip through this now, but there's a lot, just think about it. Um, the requirements, just to be sensitive to somebody that's getting older, just 
read through that. It's just like at the doorway, have something to a place to sit, maybe a, a, an area to turn it on. I mean, just, this is logical. You take in design, you take each one of these steps, and like the here's another one about the stairs. Well, you know, planning for the future <clears throat> to make these all accessible. And go ahead, the next one. Um, Embracing, you know, these are all requirements that you find all over the, all over the, um, that you just start thinking about how important this is, like, just to have uh, more accessible areas where with what wheelchair accessibility is, you know, great for everybody. So this is a project. Once you realize about accessibility, all those rules, let's take it a step higher. So this is a project I just did for um, veterans that are disabled. It's a, it's a grant that they can get um, for, um, I think it was $85,000 or something. So, but it, this was even stricter. This was four feet wide, um, two doors, you know, and it had to be, you know, five foot, the accessibility. Let's go to the next one. So it looks like, like this. You can sort of see what you, can, you could possibly get, you know. Um, once you design it one way, then you know that you can design it you know, a number of different ways. So this is Port Townsend. This is where um, the old gas station that we took over that the, the model home is at. So as I say, I'm always trying to figure out ways that we can get our artisans working and putting them in the pods for what we need. This is a, a LED lighting show. So we had sort of a bizarre, bizarre lighting. So this is sort of a, what we're doing. Um, so I think that's about it. My time is up anyway. Um, so the, um, you know, I just kind of want to leave you with that this is all, you know, there's a number of different ways that we're trying to educate people and get, get the word out. And, you know, truthfully, when I talk to people all over the United States, we're so much further ahead than they are that, you know, it really feels like we're leading and we're a team. And that I'm listening to everybody, um, their, their input um, into this project, you know, that, that we just do about, you know, um, if you were, we're trying to build, we're trying to encourage, you know, I'm so jealous that you guys have volunteers that are, that, um, that are standing in line trying to help, and I'm just going, <laughs> I'll come up with some projects on the other side. So, thank you so much. Oh, can you get to your website? Yes, um, greenpod.design. So, Hopefully you'll find some um, some things and, and write us and come play with us over on the other side for a while. This is Brad Gerber. He's our essential needs coordinator. Uh, first of all, I'm going to go through um, a few fluffy things before we get into some of the details of the, of the tiny houses and everything. Tell you a little bit about Lehigh and what we do in our mission. Um, so we provide housing um, for the benefit of low-income homeless or formerly homeless people in Washington State. Um, we advocate for just housing policies at the local, state, county, national levels. Um, we administer a range of supportive service programs that assist those with housing, um, you know, increasing their self-sufficiency, um, all range of, of services such as um, job um, searching, child care, all those kind of things. We address um, homelessness, the crisis of homelessness, in multiple ways. Um, one of this is through um, housing, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, we also have uh, urban rest stops. We have three of those in downtown Ballard and the University Districts. And in addition to that, we have shelter. Um, we have uh, we actually have a shelter um, in the Lehigh um, office in our um, below the office. And then on top of that, we have um, something that's been a more of a recent thing in the last few years is uh, encampments that have now become we're now converting totally over to tiny house villages. So this started with uh, tents, and um, and now we've. We found sort of a, a little bit of a loophole, that, which we'll also go into, which allows us to build um, tiny houses. Um, how many of you guys think that a tiny house is better than a tent? You should raise your hand. There you go. We think that too. So let me 
tell you about uh, really quickly about the Seattle's and King County's um, homelessness crisis. Um, how many of you guys are aware of the one night count? You guys know about that? Okay. So the one night count is something they do every year where they go out and they count the number of people that are like, actively sleeping on the streets and living in their cars and in shelters um, and in uh, transitional housing and those kind of things. Um, and they, uh, it, the last, this, this one's basically based on last year and the years before that numbers because they don't have 2017 out yet. Um, we just had the one night count which was retitled Count Us In um, this year. In fact, we have participated in that and we have the Ballard and Fremont uh, neighborhoods, um, a, a chunk of those. But uh, last year, um, we had, there was 4,505 people that were, that were actively on the streets. Um, not, even, not even in shelters, they were, they were sleeping on the streets. Um, and before that, it was, it was a lower number and it was a 19% increase. I mean, that's something they've seen year after year. So we, we clearly have, um, have a major crisis on our hands. And Lehigh's um, doing everything that we can to, to, uh, to help um, solve it in, in the multiple ways that, uh, that we do. So a couple things. So we have 60 properties in six different counties. Um, these serve um, those who are homeless, um, low income, disabled, mental, mental ill, mental, mentally ill, uh, senior, young adult, um, immigrant, refugee, veterans, um, families, um, people with pets, um, couples, kids, all sorts of folks. We have a couple of those properties. We have Sharon Child Court that's in Ballard that provides 50 um, apartments for seniors. Um, August Wilson Place in Bellevue, 57 workforce apartments there. Um, Ernest and Anderson Place in the Center District, there's 60 apartments for homeless and low income seniors. And um, 49 units in the University District at the new Marion, the somewhat new Marion West, that provides uh, housing for um, homeless, uh, formerly homeless young adults and low wage workers. So a couple of the organizations, um, Cher and uh, I, oh I skipped ahead, Cher and Nicholsville. Um, these are the organizations that we partner with to manage these villages, uh, the tiny house villages. They uh, these are democratically uh, ruled. Um, they, they work together to set up, you know, to set up the roles and have community meetings. And, uh, and they, they do this for all the villages that we have. Um, they are a critical component of making these happen. So Lehigh provides the funding and a lot of the volunteers and the support. Um, we have case managers that work with all of the residents of the villages. Um, but Sharon and Nicholsville are, are the, the central part that actually make the villages work. Um, and we, we, we couldn't do this without them in there and we're, we partner with them on these things. So the encampments in the tiny house villages, um, they provide multiple um, benefits. These are secure, safe communities. Um, the residents all volunteer to do 24-7 um, security. And they also do um, litter pickup in the neighborhood, um, not only in the villages themselves, but they go out in the entire neighborhood and, uh, and do this. And, that's, and there's also um, you know, there's sanitation they provide. There's hygiene facilities. Um, several of these have uh, showers and bathrooms that are that are plumbed, um, and you know they're not, they're not just uh, porta potties. These are also you know they're, they're self empowered. It, it increases people's you know dignity when they're living in a tiny house. Um, a lot of these folks are coming from straight off the streets. I mean, some of these are families with kids that are running on the streets, you know. And this, these homes provide a space for them to be in a safe community, where then they can access supportive services. Case managers work with them, and they can they get they transition right into into permanent housing from there. So that's the goal is to get everyone into permanent housing. Um, on top of that, uh, you know, there's bus, <coughs> bus ticket uh, distribution. There's HMIS reporting, reporting we have to do um, to, to just sort of track everyone and uh, make sure that we're making progress on everything. Um, and then on top of that, I should also report that um, in these communities that we, um, you know, like the fellow village, um, we'll go into the details of this a little bit, and Ballard and those spaces, um, you know, there's always, it's always kind of, you know, the community um, always has, uh, you know, questions or concerns. There's always a ton of support in, initially, you know, um, but the people ask, people are like, they're, they're kind of like, oh, what's, what's this coming to my community, you know? Um, when the villages come in, they see that, oh, wow, they, they provide security, they're doing litter pickup in my neighborhood. I mean, a fellow village where it was placed was kind of, uh, it sort of looked like a dump. And then when, when we came in and we added these colorful tiny houses, they're always like green, orange, blue, and yellow. You know, they're always in big, bright, vibrant colors. Um, and a lot of these have like designs painted on them as well. Um, but when, when we came in and built the houses and then built the community and everything, 
Um, there's, you know, we hear from all the, you know, we, we work with the police and everything else, and we hear that that these aren't even like crime problem areas, or in some cases like the uh, Othello Village, the Safeway reported that the shoplifting rate, since Othello Village came in, the shops, the shoplifting rate went down, you know, um, because there's more eyes on the neighborhood. I mean, they're kind of, they're providing more of a safe space, and they're litter pickups, so they're beautifying the communities that they're in. So a couple things. So Sharon Nicholsville, um, like I said, I already went over this part, but uh, but they also have a strict code of conduct. So there's no violence, no drugs, no alcohol, um, no sex offenders. Um, you know, no they have you know, no weapons. So they have kind of like rules to all these things to make sure that these are safe communities for for families to live in. Um, on top of that, we have leadership um, positions. So there's like head of security, there's internal affairs, external affairs. Um, that's a couple of them. And all these things that they do, volunteer-wise, they get community credits for that. Um, you know, if they participate in things or they do security or a little pickup. So really quickly on the, so some of the legislation that allowed this to happen in 2014, um, there was the tent encampment legislation um, that also allowed us to build the uh, tiny houses. So um, unlike the um, disaster at the federal level, um, we have, uh, we have uh, good things happening in, in the city. And you know, we're very proud of that. Uh, I won't be, this one's really wonky, um, so I won't get too much into this, but we have, uh, we have a lot of uh, legislation that affects the tiny house encampments. Um, the thing that's really important is that um, we have like a church in 22nd Union that has a tiny house village there with 14 houses, and that, that church, the uh, Church of the Good uh, Shepherd, um, that one um, helps to manage the village and helps to keep the operations going and everything. And there's, there's specific legislation through um, through our state that allows religious organizations to host these um, encampments with with very few uh, limits. So that's really nice to, to to be able to take advantage of that. The city of Seattle, um, Mayor Ed Murdy declared a state of uh, emergency on homelessness. Uh, I believe it was uh, last year, and that uh, that definitely opened up the funding and allowed and they you know they sanction these encampments so they they help out with the funding for all of them. Um, they did that for three of the encampments, uh, and now we have another, another, actually four being sanctioned, but there's three that are coming online, and Lehigh is going to be uh, managing uh, two of those. So that would, uh, that would put us at about five now. So how we engage the community, we have uh, public meetings, you know, we meet with the community, we, there's always this public notification period where we answer their questions. Um, we've, we've been having those in just the last few weeks because we have Georgetown and North Seattle, new tiny house villages coming up very soon and uh, we're setting up these meetings with the community to do that. We also have these community advisory committees that meet um, every month that, uh, that go over the operations of the village and make sure that we're making progress. Um, so those are always really helpful. And uh, just letters to neighbors and you know, working with our elected officials and working with community leaders. Um, the amount of volunteers and interest and donations that we receive has been absolutely wonderful and it's, it's really made these things uh, uh, possible and we, we can't be more grateful for that. I'm going to pass it over to Brad now. Okay. Well, yeah, so my name is Brad Gerber. I'm the Essential Needs Coordinator. Um, I work really closely with the tiny house villages and with the residents, um, as well as helping to communicate their needs and some of their concerns um, to Lehigh. So I kind of serve as that middleman. Um, I'm also closely involved in the establishment of these new tiny house villages. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the houses specifically in some of the existing sites. Um, so we worked with a great architecture firm to come up with this really awesome um, plan for our tiny houses. Um, they're $2,200 a piece in materials. So we partner with a ton of different volunteer organizations, vocational training programs, um, even for-profit tiny house builders who just want to get involved and help out with this. Um, and some of the things that we play with, so the International Building Code, which is nationwide, for the most part, and adopted by Seattle, says that if the house is under 120 square feet with the eaves, it doesn't have to have a building permit. So there's a lot more leniency where we place the houses and how they get permitted. Um, it allows us to put houses up very rapidly, whereas with most affordable housing, it takes about four years and about $300,000 per unit. We can put these houses up for $2,200 in just a couple months. Um, so they're about eight by 12 in our instruction booklet. It's not a dwelling unit per se, um, legally, although folks are living inside of them. But they're insulated, they're waterproof, they have multiple doors. Sometimes have lockable doors and heat for the first time in years when they move into <coughs> tiny house villages. Um, it is also portable, so it's built um, on skids that are six feet apart. And we worked really closely with some folks who were really experienced in moving houses. <coughs> we know that that is exactly the right distance to get these houses 
as portable as possible. They're pretty big. They're about 3,000 pounds or 2,000 pounds a piece. Um, and they house one and sometimes four. Uh, there are two houses right now that have between them a family of eight. So two parents and six kids. Um, so it's a lot of people and it's not ideal, but they would be intense otherwise. Yeah, so we have been partnering with the city of Seattle for, for three of our sites. They've been a great partner. Um, they've helped open up funding, as Josh mentioned. Um, this is just a picture of some of our expenses. So the total for these three encampments um, comes to just over half a million dollars. If you compared that and looked at just the creation of maybe one or two units of affordable housing, that's what you get, whereas now we're um, hosting more than 100 people um, at this time per year. And so why do people need tiny houses? Josh mentioned it a little bit. Um, there are 4,500 people who are unsheltered in King County. Um, the average rent for an apartment in Seattle is one of the highest in the country, $2,700. Uh, and without shelter, people die. In 2015, um, 91 people died as a result of homelessness. <coughs> so tiny house villages, these are just some pictures. Of, again, like I mentioned, we partner with a lot of volunteers. We do not have a formal building staff for these encampments. It is a grassroots. Um, a grassroots project. We've relied on, on anyone from even middle school students to help build the houses, Girl Scout troops to help build the houses, paint the houses, beautify the sites, spread gravel. Um, it's really the entire community of Seattle and these specific neighborhoods coming together to make sure that their neighbors are safe and housed. Um, so this is our assembly packet. Again, um, Environment Works just to put in a plug for them. They were great and they worked with us on this. Um, so these are the various building groups. There are many of them. I mean, it's incredible the partnerships that we've been able to garner. Um, so pre-apprenticeship programs, high school education programs, church groups, construction, home repair, for for-profit housing builders. Um, really, everyone you could think of has gotten involved. Um, and a youth build is one of those groups. So it's a group that um, trains folks who are homeless or coming off the streets who are young adults. Um, with some sort of apprenticeship program, they use these houses as an education tool. So we'll fundraise for the houses, send them the materials, they spit them around. Um, I have seen students build these houses and then afterwards um, try and move into them because they're actually living homeless right now. Um, Sawhorse Revolution, a plug for them. I mean, just if you want a model for how to use design building and speaking with residents about how to make these houses as operational as possible, they are just an incredible model for that. Um, have built nearly 10 houses for our program, um, a lot of different, just different structures. These are some shower and bathroom units at 22nd and Union, which is our tiny house village. Um, another house here, another in the back, just some incredible houses that they built. Um, Mercer on the Presbyterian Church built a house on our site. The Tulela Tribes Tarot Program has built almost 10 houses for our program as well, um, which is located up in Marysville. Um, the United Brother Carpenters Apprenticeship, Apprenticeship in Non-Traditional Employment for Women, the Renton Technical College, Wood Technology Center, Walsh Construction Company, um, Walsh is a great model, actually. They've been sourcing some of their houses from mock-ups that they'll use when they're building larger buildings. They have to test their materials, so they'll just test them by building a tiny house, and then afterwards, they'll just give it to us. So that's a great partnership. Oh, yeah. And he, I don't know. I don't know my pictures. Yeah. So he was just saying, there's, there's a great middle school that did, I hope there's a picture up there, they did this really cool design on the side of a building. It's been great to just like bring groups in and then get them involved. Um, whether building, painting, or anything like that. Um, Weber Thompson built a beautiful house, and they did, this is an architecture firm, they did an amazing interior with a lofted bed that's gonna be intended for families. Um, rebuilding together, they had four houses. This was Lowe's, Turner Construction, Abbott Construction, they came together and just did this incredible day where they helped build houses in our fellow site. Um, so now I'm gonna go over just really quickly the encampments that we have. Ballard Encampment has five tiny houses, 16 tent sites, um, this is a picture of kind of our barn raising day. We had almost 100 volunteers at the site that day. Um, <clears throat> this is the site plan at this site. So there's these five tiny houses on Rosas Market Street. Um, some of these tent platforms in the back. Something incredible with this one that I'll talk about. Someone came forward and donated one solar panel per structure, whether it was a tent or a tiny house, um, and erected them over a couple of months. And so now they have, where a site that doesn't have power right now, they now all have the ability to charge their phones, access the internet, all these different things. So that was an amazing donation. Um, tiny House Village, which is also Nicholsville Tiny House Village, opened in January of last year. It's got 14 tiny houses, as well as the shower bathroom units that I mentioned. Um, this is a picture of, again, one of those lofted beds and some folks building. Um, this was the first encampment just up the middle of the site. We trenched electrical. All the houses now have heat and electrical and lighting. 
this was that kind of that first trend setting house that really kind of taught us that we need to be putting that in every one of our houses so that folks have heat. Another one of those things that some people, after the switch got flipped, that was the first time they had heat in years. Um, just some more folks who were building. Um, again, those bathroom units, the plumb, plumb shower, two plumb toilets for site, site use. This is that site plan again. This is the street here, 22nd. Um, and then the houses kind of curl around the back with the communal structure. And then this corner is like a kitchen. So it's all communal um, hygiene and kitchen facilities up there. Um, this is Sharon Lee, our very um, prolific executive director who's just been the moving force in this program um, with council member Barry Gossett. Uh, and then there's Othello Village. This is our largest um, tiny house in Camden with 28 different houses, um, 10, 10 platforms. It houses anywhere from 60 to 70 people at any given time. Um, there's case management actually located on site. Um, they just had electrical flip the switch about two weeks ago, so now all of the houses have heat, which is great. Mm -hmm. They have a shower trailer that was donated by Paul Allen. It's a three-bay unit, three showers, three toilets. Um, so I think that's about it. This is just a picture of that site again. So all the houses placed here, um, and then some of these ten platforms in the back. And eventually, in two or three years, this site, which is owned by Lehigh, is going to be affordable housing, about 70 units. <coughs> so as an interim use, and this is something that we've been doing, um, and we'll be doing at our Nesbitt site, it's just in a holding pattern. There's nothing on it. We wanted to put people there. We were looking for a site. We proposed it to the city, and they said yes. So this is a far better use than just letting it sit vacant. Um, and this is Josh, this guy, <laughs> right now. Um, <laughs> this is our. This is a big building that kind of a barn raising. Um, just some more pictures of this village, an awesome mural, um, and then supportive services. If you look at the uh, the budget, supportive services is a huge part of our program. Um, providing people with bus tickets, with case management, with meals on site, um, and making sure that, that they're move, they can move effectively out of homelessness and into housing or with family wherever they need to go. Um, and this is just just really quickly our success metrics. Um, so in 2016, at these encampments, we have moved 157 people into housing um, with the use of these case management staff. It's just far easier to move people into housing when they're stable when they have a community where you can find them. Um, all of these different things it just makes it far easier. Um, we moved about 47 into shelter, um, 30 have been reunited with family, and 103 have found employment. Um, so really, just amazing metrics. It's been amazing. One last thing before we take a couple questions. We've got a couple of clipboards with sign-up sheets. We would love it if you guys could all sign this clipboard. Um, but it, next to the notes, if you could write, you know, like what you want to do. Do you want to volunteer? Do you want to donate? Do you want to do both? If you don't write any out of those, I'm going to assume you want to do both. So we're going to write in. Um, any questions? I have a question about, uh, you mentioned the loophole. Um, the 120 square feet, which is like drip line that you can build without a permit here, in theory, the city doesn't, you know, yes, you can build them, but you're really not supposed to live in them. How have you managed to officially get around that so that you've got people obviously living in these shelters? I gave this one over to Brad. Yeah. Um, so this was something that actually kind of came from the top down. So our executive director, Sharon Lee, was looking for a way to get involved in this. She had been involved with Nicholsville as they were tenting campus moving around every 90 days um, and went to the city and said, if we're going to build these, these folks some structures, how big do they need to be? Or how small can they be? And the city actually flipped around and said, well, if they're 120 square feet, you can do it. So this wasn't so much a loophole as much as even just a suggestion of being under that 120, which is the legal, uh, legal maximum. Did you go to DP? Or, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I need to find it. We could get the answer to that. Okay. So I, I'll, well, I have cards as well, so you can give those out. Yeah. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. One more. Yeah, I just wanted um, to ask you for it. Keep those around. What sort of volunteer opportunities are there? Oh, yeah. So we've got um, Georgetown coming up in, uh, what, March? It's coming up quickly, really quickly. We're like totally. Um, get ready for it. 
Um, and then we have Nesbitt in North Seattle coming up um, later in March and in April. And we need, we need volunteers um, to help build the, the houses, to help paint the houses, insulate them, uh, put plywood in them, uh, tile them, uh, beautify the whole space of the villages, um, spread gravel, um, come and, uh, you know, basically, we always have a mix of like these, these are carpenters that come and, and you know, and, and do all that and you know, all the muscle and everything. And then we've got painters, we've got all these families painting and everything. So, you know, there's, there's all, um, so have uh, basically just a whole mix of it. anybody can volunteer, basically, and we always have a task for them. So there's lots of things to do. These are big fun parties and we feed everyone, you know. We have like a Zell's chicken, and I just I don't know if they're coming for the Azels or the volunteering. Um, but, uh, you know, we have some things for the vegetarians too, you know. Um, but we have, uh, but these villages, like a fellow village, we have over 300 volunteers that came and volunteered there. And our first big day, 120 people showed up. And I was, that was actually, I was a few weeks on the job. And 120 people showed up, and they're kind of looking at me, and I'm like, oh my god, I got it. You know, so like, okay, you 30 go over here and do gravel, you, you 40 do the painting, you know. Um, but, uh, but these are always a lot of fun, so we would love it if you guys would sign up to volunteer for that. And we really need donations as well. Um, we need to raise money for these because, you know, the, the city is, is only has so much that they can provide in, in private organizations. So just as any donations that we could get to build these would be wonderful. Um, Sally Bagshaw's vision is a, is a you know, council member, Sally Bagshaw, is a thousand tiny homes um, around the city, and we're kind of scratching the surface. So, um, so that would be wonderful if you guys could do that. And I'm going to take maybe just one more, and then we're out of time. Oh, we're out of time. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris. I'm uh, with the Eco Building Guild out of the Olympia chapter. And I'm excited today because we have uh, we have Coyote Village down in Olympia. and. The group that started Coyote Village, which is 30 little houses with a common house, they're now announcing that their uh, plans to build two more tiny home villages in, in Olympia. So that's exciting. And you know, there's these this this whole movement is going forward with tiny home villages to, to house the homeless, with uh, ADUs to create more density, and, and all this. It's there's a lot of momentum starting to build. And it's gotten individual people really excited too. And so the next group of speakers, I, I'm lucky to get to introduce because we have, uh, in addition to these kind of bigger developers, you know, uh, designers and um, programs like Lehigh, we have these kind of grassroots bootstrap projects that are uh, individuals who uh, are not just trying to create a solution for themselves, but for their communities. And so the next couple of speakers. Uh, we're going to do something kind of special where each of them is going to get a few minutes to talk about their project. And uh, just like Lehigh just did, we're going to invite you all to contribute uh, either by getting involved in volunteering or by donating to their, their, their short-term crowdfunding campaign. So that we can go beyond today just listening and learning about this and getting excited about it to actually helping this move forward and happen. So you guys have the opportunity to be the engine of change by uh, donating and contributing to your time. So each project that you're about to hear about, in the back there's a donation jar and a, uh, and a sign-in sheet for you to contribute to. And the goal here that we kind of set internally, and who knows if we'll make it, but what if we, uh, what if we collectively could donate $3,000 to these three projects tonight and then each of them will have crowdfunding campaigns going forward over the next couple of months that you can get involved with by helping spread the word. So uh, that's what we're going to hear from now and um, the three speakers that we're going to hear from, I'm not sure what order we have, but um, uh, I'm going to introduce Phil Ginsberg who's working on the 100 Mile House, which is part of Evergreen, I'm sorry, Emerald Village in Eugene, Oregon. We have Pat Rasmussen, yeah, that's a good one. Pat Rasmussen from Olympia, is my buddy for the last 20, last 30 years or something. Um, Pat's uh, got a project to build hemp tiny homes for seniors. And then uh, we also have Lisa, I'm sorry, Sarah Smith from the Sawhorse Re Revolution. And you actually heard about them in the Lehigh project because they've been helping build those Lehigh houses. And they have another new youth driven project that we're going to hear about as well. So uh, let's start off with, uh, yeah, sure, come on as well. I don't, I don't think we have a set order. So go ahead, Sarah. I, I think my slides. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You do have a set order. I just didn't hear about it ahead of time. Sarah's first. <laughs> Okay, great, sir. Glad to have you here. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I'm honored to follow up uh, with all these great projects. Um, Lehigh, of course, among them, 
Uh, we work closely with Lehigh, uh, building tiny houses for the homeless that go to the Lehigh organized villages. So what we do is really tied up in a much larger network of organizations and groups that make it possible. Um, well, I'll just back up a little bit. Uh, my name is Sarah Smith. I'm the program director with a nonprofit called Sawhorse Revolution. We are a nonprofit that's dedicated to teaching teens the art of carpentry and craft. And not just teaching it to them so that they go become carpenters, but as like a viable, awesome after school pro program and experience that makes you feel stronger, more empowered, and by the way, introduces you to skills that you could potentially take into a job or just take into your college application. Uh, which we have, so our students go a number of different places, and we really are first and foremost a youth education program that at its core is trying to maximize and question what youth education means and what education means. So I'll talk a little bit about our Tiny House Initiative because it's basically been our flagship program uh, for the past few years. Um, and then at the end of the project, kind of focus in, or at the end of the talk, focus in on one of the tiny houses that's now in Othello Village, and then talk about how you all can come get involved, because uh, we're rethinking what a fundraiser is. So anyways, here we go. Uh, go ahead. Um, so, Sawhorse Revolution started in 2010 uh, as an all-volunteer summer camp up at a farm in Arlington called Smoke Farm. You might have heard Burning Beast up there. Um, which is a big feast in a field, but we also do a summer camp there. And go to the next. Uh, so for our first, I'll just do it, thank you. Save you the trouble. Um, for our first project, we built a tree house with 15 high schoolers. Um, and it really <laughs> was a total adventure. Uh, we had five builders, 10 counselors, and 15 teens. And you know, of course, the utmost of safety, the worst injury we've ever had is an ingrown toenail. Um, so we've been <laughs> prioritized that throughout. But the concept of Sawhorse and the reason I'm showing you this tree house instead of the tiny house is that we really need to inspire young people about what's possible and what they can do. And take this, this prompt, which is building, design, construction, and turn that into an amazing experience for a lot of people. And just, you know, instead of like saying like, okay, cool, we got our house designed, now we're just gonna do it a lot. We always stop, redesign, rethink what's gonna happen next, and try to make it cooler more exciting, make it better, change it, you know, make it more community oriented. Um, and of course, when we went into the city, oops, wrong way, as an after school program, we had to figure out how we were going to adjust this inspiring summer camp format into something that would work in the city, something that connects you with your surroundings the way that a treehouse makes you feel connected to the forest. Um, so we went through a lot of different options. We did some garden sheds, we did um, a project with the Seattle Public Library, but nothing quite captured our mission to be connected to your own community as building tiny houses for the homeless. And what you see behind me, or yeah, is a <laughs> tiny house. This is the first one we ever did, covered in street signs that we got at a dollar a pound for the street signs. It was a deal with the city. We didn't steal them. And uh, <laughs> this, this was, uh, maybe you saw it actually, it was at the Nicholsville on Dearborn back when Nicholsville was over there. Um, so this house is a great example of how we kicked off our process, which is like, okay, you know, we have this idea, we want to do tiny houses for homeless. Lehigh was still working out there. Um, I think the tiny house villages were nascent at this point, so it wasn't really a thought in anyone's mind. Um, but we were like, okay, we want to try this, let's just do it. So the first house that we built was way too tall, too narrow, um, <laughs> and we never quite finished the loft bed. So, but it was a really awesome experience for the students. They were to work writing this program, actually getting a stipend to learn carpentry and build this house. We're there when we delivered it to the village with a lot of, you know, aching and pushing it up in the mud. Um, so it was, a, it was a really, it was a ton of fun, um, and we learned a lot. So that next time when we started working on our tiny houses, we could take what we learned and make the next one better. Make the next one more adjusted, more uh, accommodating of residents' needs. So what you see behind me are, um, I think it's on your left, the black house is called, we call it the nest, I saw you had one called the nest as well, but it's a charred cedar house that was designed by our students in a design build program led by Olsen Kunde. On the right, uh, that was the next year's design build project, and that one actually has flexible storage, um, that storage wall that you can see moves back and forth, and there's also a trundle bed that can flip open and either be one bed for a couple, it can be a tiny bed if it's just you and you want to maximize your space, 
or you can move that storage wall, move the bed around, and almost have two rooms. Um, so we're really trying to in innovate and experiment within this form of tiny house building and do that as a way to engage young people, uh, to empower them, to really introduce them to design and also just like an awesome collaborative experience with great food. Uh, so <laughs> just to, I wanted to talk a little bit about this house because it's a great, uh, I, it's a great um, example of what happens when you use iterative design and you take into account residents' feedback. I actually go to the villages pretty frequently, once just a couple blocks from my house, to check in on the houses, see how they're doing, you know, how's the condensation level, is the ventilation okay? Uh, and we've heard the burn cedar kind of is too dirty, so we may not do that again, or we'll have to seal it. But a lot of the feedback that we got over time was that priorities are storage and having a porch. Because a porch is your own private space, that's also social. It's a place where you can hang out and relax. Um, and this porch is especially custom because it has a student design storage bench, so you can put your extra stuff in the storage bench, and then those little cubbies. Um, and that's because we saw, and this was before there was power in some of the villages, but that during the wintertime, residents would have their dairy like out on their stairs. And it's basically the old school form of refrigeration where you don't have any electricity, but you just leave it out in the cold. Um, so the, those shelves are there for really anything the residents want, but with the specific idea that, yeah, maybe you could keep your dairy there. Um, this house is all made of, it's 80% salvage materials. The only things I think that weren't were the insulation and the fasteners. Um, so, and yeah, I won't go into too much of the provenance, but we worked with builders from Shukart Dow on this one. There's a loft bed. I think when I visited the village a few months ago, there were five people living in the house. I think that's gone back down, um, and I could be wrong, so I'm sorry if I am. But uh, I'll just talk, though, I think the most fun one here, and this is where like material donations can be a huge help for organizations like Sawhorse, who can really put them to good use. Um, but you see how those floorboards and how um, the like closet kind of has that cool saw grain on it. These, these were actually old concrete floorboards that had been custom milled for like a multi multi million dollar house, and our builder just kind of like took them off the site, and then our students cleaned them up, you know, took out all the staples, like scraped off the concrete, sanded them down, and it makes a beautiful finished floor, um, as well as the uh, the interior, which has a nice stain on it. Uh, so we're really, uh, there you can see there's a uh, desk, and we use the nice wood to kind of give you a, a cozy feeling. Um, so anyways, sorry to just abruptly end that, but basically, can I have a minute? So where we're, where we're going next with this, uh, Sommers Revolution serves about 100 students a year, and we get a lot of press, so we have a lot of people interested in helping out, where we've been trying to figure out, as a tiny, tiny organization, how we can do that. So we're basically pioneering something we're calling a benefit build, but it's a multi-day community build where anybody on a sliding scale can buy a ticket, come build with us, have a huge barbecue at the end, and it'll both create more tiny houses for homeless and fund our future projects. Um, we do need some skilled volunteers for this, so if you know a ticket is not your jam, that's totally fine. Um, but for the most part, we're really trying to get out there and just invite families, invite people to come get their ticket and come to what we think is going to be a pretty fun fundraiser. Um, and it's going to be a unique form of fundraiser because instead of having the gala, which which we could fake it, you know, I can <laughs> I can take off the work boots every once in a while, but it's just I think it's going to feel really proper and right to have a big work party with a bunch of people in some great tiny houses and raise funds for our programs. So the first one is coming up June tenth. Um, there are actually cards. I made little note cards with teeny tiny writing on them, so you can take one of those home with you, and you can also leave a name and an email address, and you'll have the first access to the tickets for this build. You'll be the early bird invitees. Um, so if you're interested in coming, we're also offering uh, like a corporate sponsorship sort of build day form, because also many times companies want to engage in this kind of work. So if you do have a company or know one that would be interested in a day like that, this is our way of getting involved and really trying to sort of make the most of that experience to support our future youth programs. Thank you so much for the time. I think we have time for one super quick question.
Do students have interest in other um, activities like welding and metalwork? Are you, are you interested in other curriculum like that? Yeah, I mean, we definitely are. And it's one reason that we're, we're having like a fundraiser oriented year because we want to grow our uh, spectrum of, in, of programs that we can offer. But the only way to do that is by hiring more staff at this point. Um, but yeah, we would love to do that. And Coyote Central is just on the street from us, so in my heart of hearts, I hope we can partner with them, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. Do um, your students uh, actually get involved with apprenticeships for the multi-trades through your program? It really depends. Um, we've definitely helped students apply to architecture school, and we've also referenced them to jobs. But, you know, when I was 16, I didn't totally know what I wanted to do with my life. So really, what our goal is, and I think how we make a big impact, is just by being inspiring and building amazing structures with teens and showing that this is possible. So that maybe when they're 25, they're like, huh, you know, turns out I could use a job that pays $25 an hour. Awesome. So thanks, everybody. Wow, that's really inspiring. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think it's really uh, interesting that she's inviting us to come and help with the bill. And uh, we see that coming up with more and more with these small projects. And so uh, as the Eco Building Guild, we want to we wanna play a supportive role. And so like uh, Pat was talking about earlier, we're going to create a steering committee of folks, or actually call it a support committee, where we want to organize a quarterly series of meetings and workshops uh, to go help where we'll organize a group of people to go help on projects like this. So uh, if, you, if you feel like you got to leave early, um, don't forget to stop by the table in the back, sign in some of these sheets, grab a flyer, uh, make a donation, or get the uh, information for the crowdfunding so you can make the donation later. Um, next we have Pat Rasmussen from Olympia. I mean, to make uh, hemp tiny homes for seniors and uh, I'm a senior I'm 71 years old I'm building the first industrial hemp insulated tiny home on a trailer in the state right in Olympia to show other seniors how they too could build their own secure warm comfortable green home on a small budget many seniors like me on $800 or less a month social, social security. Uh, some had jobs that didn't put uh, retirement away for them like me. I worked for nonprofits and they didn't set anything aside for me. You have to be creative to get by on less than $800. Everyone deserves a secure, warm place to live that they can afford, and they can, a tiny home. <coughs> Insulated with hemp, powered with solar, means no heating or electricity bills. Natural hemp insulation with energy efficient design means no heating is required. For a stationary tiny home, 12 inch walls of hempcrete, hemp and lime, are used for R30 um, insulation. For tiny homes on trailers, hemp insulation can be blown in so the weight isn't too much. Solar panels on the roof mean no electricity bills. Aquion saltwater solar batteries are safe and sustainable. Solar water heating provides hot water. My tiny home will sit on an Iron Eagle trailer uh, designed for tiny houses so it can be moved when needed and long lasting. Last year, the Washington State Legislature passed a law making it legal for farmers to grow industrial hemp. The first seeds go in the ground in April. The Washington State Department of Agriculture is developing a program to ensure quality products by providing the best seeds. Hemp building products will be available by next fall. Our hemp insulated tiny homes are helping to foster a new industry for our state. It's time to get ready for building with hemp. A tiny home can be on a trailer so it can be moved as the senior ages and might need to be in a different place. A senior tiny home village with shared health care to age in place or eventually to be by family. The tiny home can be in a community space, a tiny home village, or as an additional dwelling unit ADU in someone's yard where they can live in community with the home 
dwellers, and other friends in the neighborhood of their choice and with a network of support. <coughs> we'll be building with friends, so 11 homes for 11 seniors. Seniors will work together to build my tiny house while learning the skills to build their own. We'll work together with partner organizations and agencies to build a program and develop funding sources so many seniors can take advantage of the new Tiny Homes for Seniors housing solution. Partners will be working with the City of Olympia as they launch the Missing Middle uh, project. Your support can make it happen. Um, by no donating to my project, you will set off a new, green, affordable revolution, Hemp Tiny Homes for Seniors. So I, I'm, the goal to raise to begin with is 51000 I have a GoFundMe, and it's Hemp Seniors uh, Build Tiny Houses. You can donate tonight at our table. We're launching our campaign March 1. I already have in-kind donations for the solar panels and install installation, structured water unit, and discounts for the Iron Eagle trailer and Aquion solar batteries. Your donations, joined by other donations, will make it possible. This is why I'm asking you to help me get off to a strong start on the campaign, and we'll start building uh, the 1st of May. So your donations will go to pay for the design, by Joseph Becker of Ion Eco Building and Matt Eklund of Northwest Hemp Builders for the wood, the windows, the tiny house trailer from Iron Eagle made especially for tiny homes, the solar panels and installation from Pure Solar, a new company locally producing solar panels in Olympia with Aquion saltwater batteries, hemp insulation from Colorado, uh, where they're already growing industrial hemp and hemp installation by Matt Eklund of Northwest Hemp Builders. Eco Builder planning and support by Joseph Becker of Ion Eco Building. Work parties for seniors led by Joseph Becker of Ion Eco Building and Matt Eklund. Uh, grant writing for the next 10 seniors, tiny homes and permit processes by me through my nonprofit Edible Forest Gardens. The donations are tax deductible because they go through my nonprofit, and the design will be shared freely on a YouTube video and other ways. And you can find more information at our GoFundMe Help Seniors Build Tiny Homes, our website SeniorHempTinyHomes.com, uh, Facebook Senior Hemp Tiny Homes, or you can email me at Edible Forest Gardens at gmail.com or call me or text me 509-669-1549 and please share this with your friends and networks to help this project along. Thank you very much. <laughs>
where the residents are members of a housing cooperative and can build equity uh, through self-governance. Uh, it's, it's a community philosophy, uh, a participatory uh, equity community philosophy. Uh, attached tiny homes that share common facilities and gardens. The need for affordable housing in Eugene and Lane County, much like you've heard tonight about Seattle and King County, is urgent with an average five-year wait time for a one-bedroom subsidized housing. 22, 160 to 288 square foot tiny houses will be built this summer at EDE. It will be the first affordable, cooperative, tiny house community in the nation. Residents will be members of a housing cooperative that will make monthly payments of around $250 to $350, affordable for persons who live on limited income, such as SSI, or do part-time work. People who otherwise would be unable to afford market rate housing. Now, the usual feature here is that part of these uh, payments will accrue and each resident will have a financial share or stake in the community, creating a modest asset that can be cashed out if and when they decide to move. Residents will have responsibilities, there will be three of them. First, to abide by a set of community agreements. Second, to attend the monthly village meeting to discuss issues of common interest and concern. And third, to give at least 10 volunteer hours per month toward the operation and maintenance of the village. Thus, the residents will be active members of their community. <coughs> 14 Eugene-based architects have provided in-kind services to design and construct the high-quality tiny houses, each complete with sleeping and living areas, a kitchenette, and a bathroom. Now let's talk specifically about the 100 mile tiny home. Uh, three individuals, Connor Anderson, Alicia Ginsburg, and Sarah Tamier, have designed and will build one of the 22 homes. Alicia is the project coordinator for Square One Village. <coughs> this home, the 100 mile home, will be the first permitted light straw clad home, light straw clad <coughs> home in Lane County and the only home in the village using natural building techniques, sourcing most of its resources from within 100 miles. This building will showcase aesthetic elements of a naturally insulated, plastered, and finished home, and sets a public example within the village model of how natural building, affordable housing, and community involvement works symbiotically to provide one type of solution to today's critical housing shortage. <coughs> the project will demonstrate a natural building process that uses minimal industrial materials and incorporates local labor, skills, knowledge, and the rich resources of the Willamette Valley. The house will be located on a uh, north-facing site facing site <clears throat> with open community space to the north and east. The tiny house features a wraparound porch with seating to enhance easy interaction with neighbors, earthen floors, and natural plasters. So that, that's the <coughs> concept. That's what it will look like when it's finished this summer. <clears throat> the design is, in, is intended to provide a ready incorporation of this one unit into the overall community, ease of access, uh, again, building the sense of, uh, of community. Embraced by much of the Eugene community, and the name of this group of three people I mentioned is Dirt Chic. <laughs> it's there, it's heard first here. Uh, they want to make this 
give away a building also accessible um, nationally. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute, how this model will be available at no cost uh, throughout the country. The cost independent of land is $22,000, which dirt sheet builders are in the process of fundraising. <laughs> The costs are reduced because there will be donated materials and volunteer labor. There will also be some paid skilled workers. <coughs> One of the goals of the design is to see it replicated nationally. As a result, the project's process and construction documents will be open source and shared. So somebody in Maine, or Colorado, or California can get access to this at no cost except for the printing. One of the projects, excuse me, the, the materials that were made available nationally will include uh, a repair and care manual. In addition, Square One Villages is developing a comprehensive toolbox for communities planning their own affordable tiny house villages. The 100 mile home design will be a contribution to this, this resource. Uh, there are opportunities for people in this room. Um, Eugene isn't far away. It's a lovely place. Uh, there, there will be opportunities to do a variety of the construction. Uh, there's a sign up back there. Um, if you can't spend some time doing your own kind of uh, working for your skill set, um, you are encouraged to, uh, to contribute. I think they've raised about a third to a half of the 22,000. Thank you very much. I don't know I have, I have the skill set, but I will try to answer any questions you may have. Yes? Do you know the dimension of the size? It's about 250 square feet. Yes? Are there going to be a lot of other types of structures? Uh, you said there are going to be 22. Are they all going to be? No, each one will be different. You may have heard of, of Bill Bowerman, the famous track coach at the University of Oregon. His son is an architect, and he's uh, contributed two or three designs. Thank you very much. But before we get to that part, we want to actually hear a couple more projects that are just up and coming and they're really awesome. So um, we have like some three minute presentations. You guys pop up and I'll count on call you. I don't know who it actually is. There's one. Come on over here. And start with your name because I don't actually have that. Uh, my name is Patricia Newkirk and uh, I work and live at Sangaya Co-Housing Community. We have a robust internship program every summer and we are um, needing more places to house those interns. Um, so we're, uh, as someone said earlier, the um, tents are not as good as uh, micro shelters. So we're going to build um, several micro shelters at Sangaya. And we're looking for people that would like to help um, get their hands uh, in on that. Um, the first one is going to be uh, started. The foundation is going to be done on March 25th. And it's on a slope, and it's in the forest, so we're minimizing the impact on the forest. And uh, anybody that wants to know how to begin to build a foundation on a, on a slope in a forest, that would be an interesting workshop. And then the micro shelter build is going to be Friday and Saturday, March 31st and April 1st. If you're interested, you can Google um, Eventbrite micro shelter for more information about that. My name is Alan Jones, I'm a Greenwood resident, and I'm doing a project calling it Just Right House. And I thank the Eco Builders Guild for providing the opportunity to, and the platform to share these projects. It's amazing. Psychologist Rollo May said, in human beings, courage is necessary to make being and becoming possible. And I'm going to build a house, but I don't want to do it alone. So I'm finding my own courage to take this on and share it with all of you. I see this build as sort of a modern barn raising, bringing a community together 
community of like-minded humans who bring their own courage and share in a dream of what is possible. This house will be small, what I'm calling Just Right House. Everything anyone, well, most anyone, needs in 160 to 200 square feet. Though I don't yet have a completed design, some of the features I'd like to implement are 80% re-envisioned materials, harvested rainwater shower from cisterns, natural plaster, solar, gray water, rain garden, and many more. The project, which is in Greenwood, will start in May when my old garage is taken apart piece by piece so we can reuse all the material that's salvageable. So that's the what and the how, and I'd like to touch on the why. Shelter is a basic human need and should be a right. Seattle is expensive. And good people are leaving because they can't afford housing. Small homes like the Just Right House may not be the solution for everyone, but it could be for some. Even more so, this build is about community. People coming together in a safe, open, encouraging, supportive setting where ideas are shared and skills and confidence are gained. Where we all learn together. Even if you've never picked up a hammer in your life, you have something to contribute. So I'd like to put an emphasis on women learning building skills in an environment that supports and empowers women to learn the fundamentals of home building. So this is my invitation to you to become a part of this community. Meet new people, gain some knowledge, commit to have, uh, to, to commit to however much time you have to give, skilled or unskilled, in building we all bring something to the site. So if what I've said resonates with you, please sign up in the Just Right House sheet in the back, and I will personally contact everyone. Come be a part of this conversation. Thanks for again for the opportunity to share this project.